Uh, I got to know him through our SDC for quantum, uh, uh, integrated quantum materials, where uh, Howard is one of the core uh, universities, and we have four of our Howard students here uh, as part of the research effort. Um, he got his uh, uh, undergraduate degree at Ohio State and PhD, at, excuse me, at uh, PhD at uh, Ohio State, uh, went on to a postdoc, uh, and then went on to Berkeley. And he had been at Howard for a long time. He had the interesting position of actually being an NSF uh, program officer, and so you can ask him secrets about how they uh, actually make their decisions. At Howard, he's had a very nice career. He's won a teaching award there as being one of their uh, best instructors. And recently, he had the met uh, Martin Luther King uh, uh, visiting professor uh, position. And so he's going to tell us today about some theoretical work. Uh, Thanks, Bob. Can you hear me? How's, how's it now? Testing? OK. So this afternoon, I'm going to tell you about some efforts, experimental and theoretical efforts, and looking at group four elements as potential color centers in diamond. So the nitrogen vacancy is perhaps the most famous uh, color center. You can form it by taking the carbon lattice in diamond and just replacing two of the carbon atoms with a vacancy in nitrogen and then adding an electron to it. What you've been able to make is, or realize, that nature provides its own version of a, tra a trapped atomic system. And there are a whole host of applications for the NV Center, both in quantum computing and in quantum information processing. So some important highlights to recognize about this particular color center the electron spin has excellent coherence times, even at room temperature. This has obvious device implications. The spin state that you can prepare using this NV color center can be prepared and manipulated, and you can read in and read out light or radiation. And the coherence time for this particular color center can be enhanced by coupling the electronic spin with the nuclear spin. So, there are some good things about the NV Center in Diamond. There are some bad things. It has a very strong zero phonon line at about 637 nanometers. And you can see that at low temperature. Unfortunately, in that uh, zero phonon line, the amount of fluorescence that's seen is quite low. It's only about 4%. The other problem with the NV Center in Diamond is it has an electric dipole moment. And that's going to allow it to couple with external electric fields and magnetic fields. That's going to cause decoherence with the signal from the NV center. And it also causes havoc with the optical spectra. So people are interested in trying to come up with other color centers to avoid this problem, in particular from the elements in the uh, group four column in the periodic table, uh, by exploiting the fact that Silicon, germanium, lead, and tin also form color centers. Here's a picture of one of them for silicon. Uh, here are the two vacancies. And the silicon color center is defined by having a silicon atom midway between these two vacancies. The nice thing about this structure and its symmetry is it doesn't have a dipole moment. So it's not susceptible to problems from external fields like the NV center. It does have about 60% of its luminescence in the zero phonon line. That's a very stable optical spectra. The disadvantage of, of the silicon, of, uh, silicon vacancy is that it has a very long, long uh, short coherence time. So other color centers, there's been a lot of work on silicon vacancies. Recently, or say about three, four years ago, people have been able to make a single, room, single photon room temperature emitter by using germanium. And again, its geometry is such that there is no, uh, it, has, it has inversion symmetry. The atom is essentially located midway between these two vacancy sites. These are 
this is an optimized picture using density functional theory, what the structure should look like. Um, again, it has nice fluorescence properties in terms of uh, zero phone online, the amount of emission from that line. You can use DFT to calculate its electronic structure and its optical properties, but it has a short coherence time. Now, uh, there's a lot of work in the group of Misha Lucan and uh, Marco Longchar in trying to solve that problem by putting strain on these systems to change the electronic structure of these particular color centers. Quite recently, about a year ago, Iwasaki and his group in Japan were able to fabricate a color center using tin. And the nice thing about this breakthrough is that the uh, tin vacancy has a much longer coherence time at, high, at room temperature than the silicon vacancy. So this makes it ripe for lots of application in device physics. Very recently, this year, uh, Pri Narang, Dirk Englund, and their collaborators were actually able to make the first cryogenic single photo, um, photon emitter using lead. So again, here's a picture of its DFT optimized structure. Again, no inversion symmetry. It has a 520 nanometer phone online, zero phone online. And DFT, these uh, investigators were able to use DFT to calculate the optimized structure for the system, as well as optical transitions for it. So one of the questions that got us interested in this problem is, can theory play a role in helping us to understand the properties of these group four color centers in diamond, and how to improve them for lots of applications in quantum information science and quantum communications. So I've already shown you a lot of work where people have exploited the ability to use density functional theory to determine an optimized geometry for the color center, and also detailed information about optical transitions. What I'm going to focus on this afternoon is using theory, in particular, a particular application of quantum mechanics, density functional theory, to calculate the formation energy for isolated color centers in diamond, and also look at or address the problem of how stable are these color centers in a real material, not a Charlie Cattell, Ashcroft, Merman version of a solid, but a real solid. Real solids have defects, dislocations, uh, and lots of other things going on that you have to take into account. So the first issue is to ask the question, how much energy does it take to form a defect in a solid? How do you calculate the formation energy of a defect? And that problem really is not a mechanical question, it's a thermodynamic question. And it comes back to solving a simple problem in equilibrium statistical mechanics. How do you know when a system is in equilibrium? What are the ramifications for that? So a chemical reaction is a thing where you have reactants on one side of the equation, products on the other. So imagine reactants A and B, given by their respective stoichiometric coefficients, nu A and nu B, and you do a reaction, a chemical reaction, and you produce products C and D, also weighted by their respective stoichiometric coefficients. In thermodynamics, if you're looking at a system where the pressure and the temperature are the key knobs that you want to vary experimentally, then the appropriate state function to worry about is the Gibbs free energy. It depends upon the temperature of the system, it depends upon the pressure of the system, and it depends upon the number of particles that you have in the system. So the changes in the uh, Gibbs free energy, there essentially are three terms to pay attention to in thermodynamics. One is the actual amount of work that you can do on the system. The other is the amount of heat flow that uh, the system has with its surroundings. And the third is a question of matter flow. Namely, when you have a system that has the ability to change the number of particles in it, then there is a change in its, give, in its Gibbs free energy, and that's indicated by this term, where nu is essentially the chemical potential of that molecule, atom, uh, whatever. The chemical potential is essentially the amount of work needed to move a particle, be it an atom or molecule, and dn is the change in the number of particles in the system. So you would like to figure out what conditions does thermodynamics tell you must be satisfied for this chemical equation to be in equilibrium. 
And there's a simple way to do this. If you replace the change in the number of particles in the system by some variational parameter lambda, and nu is the uh, stoichiometric coefficient that appears four times in the above equation, and just plug that into this relationship, and then just minimize the Gibbs free energy for fixed pressure and temperature, that's the condition for equilibrium. And that simply turns out to be this equation, that the sum of the chemical potentials of the reactants must equal the sum of the chemical potentials of the products. There's another more intuitive way to look at chemical potentials. A chemical potential is like a force, but I'll put that in quotations. That is to say, if this equation is in chemical equilibrium, the reactants have a force on the products, the products have a force on the reactants. And when these two forces, again in, in quotes, meet, the system is in equilibrium. So how can we apply this to defects? So let's start with a cartoon where we ask the question, how much energy does it cost to make a neutral defect in a solid? So what you're doing is you're taking a bulk solid, or a piece of a bulk solid, you're removing from it an atom, and you're leaving a vacancy. That's the problem you want to tackle, but by analogy with what we've talked about previously, that's simply a chemical reaction, where here are the reactants, here are the products. So at equilibrium, what must be true is that the formation energy for this system is just the total energy of products minus the total energy of reactants. But there's more than that. If this system is in equilibrium, then the chemical potential of the bulk must be equal to the chemical potential of the defect uh, of the solid minus a defect, minus a, an atom, plus the chemical potential of the atom. That's what this equation says here. And you know what the total energy of the system is with a defect. You can measure it or calculate it. The energy per particle is just the chemical potential. The energy of the bulk or a piece of the bulk you can measure or calculate. The energy that it takes to remove the atom from the system is the chemical potential. It's the work needed to remove an atom from a system. And that's, that's designated by its chemical potential. So the, formulate, the formation energy for this neutral defect is simply given by this expression. Now, things get a little bit more complicated if the defect is charged. And you certainly would imagine situations where that could be in play. So again, the formula you're going to use, the recipe you're going to use is, very, is again, is the same. You're going to start out with a piece of bulk material. You're going to remove an atom, creating a positive defect. And Ensuring that charge is conserved, you have an electron out here. Again, this is simply a chemical equation. So just using chemical thermodynamics to understand what's going on, you can write down an equation that says that the chemical potential for all the species on the left-hand side of this equation must equal the sum of all the chemical potentials on the right-hand side. And that's what this equation says here. Energy, or the energy of this bulk, is just the free energy, the Gibbs free energy per particle. You can measure this or calculate this. This is the energy of this system where you've removed a atom and, and left in its wake a positively charged defect. You have the work needed to move this atom from the system with respect to some reference. That's the chemical potential of the atom. It's different for lead than it is for iron than it is for magnesium. And then you have to worry about how much work do you have to do to remove an electron from this system. And in particular, that's simply the chemical, the electron chemical potential, or it's the Fermi level. Yes, sir. Let's say it's got anions, but in different atoms, like that. Well, here I'm just, so you're asking about what do I need to know about this particular chemical species? Well, the, 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 the chemical nature matters. Here I'm just saying, saying I just take a simple atom out that, uh, and I've, I've left in its wake 
a positive defect and have removed an electron from it. So I'm saying the chemical identity doesn't. If I'm doing this in the lab, right? If I create a diatomic molecule mm -hmm. So you can certainly make this more complicated if that's what you're getting at. Well, you're saying that might not be the process that actually happens in the lab, right? Like if I'm actually going to do this reaction, at the end of the day, I might get a diatomic molecule. <coughs> so in this equilibrium, there's a bottleneck that has to happen. Well, I, I, we, we, we can address this later after, after the presentation, but I would just say for this particular case of modeling or creating this positive defect, this is the appropriate thermodynamics. But, but, but you know, we, we'll talk about this offline. So again, the thermodynamics tells you that if you want to form this defect, positively charged, you've got two parameters that you have to play with. You have the Fermi level of the system, and you have the chemical potential of this atomic species that you're removing from the bulk. Everything else is a constant or can be measured. The chemical potential of the species that you remove from this, it's known with respect to some reference. So that you have to fix and it's going to be different from chromium than it would be from lead or zinc. The amount of energy needed to remove this electron to create this positive defect would be the Fermi level, and that's variable. So for a positively charged defect, the formation energy is going to be linear in the Fermi level with a positive slope. Um, for a negatively charged defect, the process is going to be reversed, namely the Formation energy is going for fixed chemical potential. It's going to be dependent upon the Fermi level, and it's going to be a, it's going to be linear with a negative prefactor. So, let's recognize that when you form defects in solids, there are many ways to do this. You can form, or there are many types of defects. You can have a defect that's neutral. You can have a defect that's positively charged. You can have a defect that's negatively charged. And you could have a defect that has the ability to have different charge states, or it's amphoteric. So thermodynamics tells us this is our formation energy for our system. And here I'm plotting this as a function of the Fermi level of the host material. And here's the valence band and the conduction band. I'll typically measure the Fermi level to be zero at the top of the valence band. So when Q equals zero, namely I have a neutral charge state, the formation energy is constant for any value of the Fermi level. That's what this equation tells you explicitly. If you, in fact, look at the creation of a negatively charged defect state, it, the formation energy is linear in the Fermi level, and it has a positive slope, and you can imagine a case where your defect has the ability to have a negative charge state. So for an amphoteric charge, uh, amphoteric defect, you have the ability of ha existing in three different states, Q equals one, Q equals minus one, Q equals zero. And the bottom line is that these transitions indicated by this dashed line, these two sets of dashed lines is important to understand. These points here tell you exactly for what Fermi level the charge state can go from a positive charge state to a negative charge state, or from a neutral charge state to a uh, uh, negative charge state. The key thing is, you ask yourself both theoretically and experimentally, what is the most stable charge state that this defect would have for a given Fermi level? And the answer is indicated by this solid red line. If you have a Fermi level for the system that's here, the most favored charge state is going to be zero, a neutral defect. If it's up here, it's going to be minus one. And if it's uh, down here, it's plus one. So the Fermi level is going to be an important creature to worry about. The question is, I have blithely written this equation down and assume that I know how to play with this Fermi level. How, do, in fact, do I do that? So I start out with the Fermi-Dirac distribution, which tells me the probability that a state in a semiconductor is occupied by an electron. I'll make an assumption that I have a non-degenerate sem uh, semiconductor. I don't have too many electrons excited into the conduction band. 
So making that approximation and simplifying the Fermi Dirac distribution function, I can get nice simple relationships for the density of electron carriers in the semiconductor, depending on the Fermi level and the temperature, as well as the whole carrier concentration. And there are prefactors that are also temperature dependent. Now, if you want to vary this Fermi level, one way to look at it is look at the case of an intrinsic semiconductor, where the whole, all whole and electron carriers are equivalent. In that case, you can calculate and show that there is something called an intrinsic Fermi level in the, or intrinsic level in the system, which essentially is mid-gap. Uh, it's exactly mid-gap if, in fact, you're at finite, temp if you're at zero temperature or if the curvature of the conduction band minimum is parabolic or free electron light and the curvature of the uh, conduction band at the Van Lipsner maximum is free electron light. Um, you can show by putting all this together that the Fermi level is going to depend upon the electron and whole carrier concentrations. And if you increase the electron carrier density, the Fermi level of the system is going to be increased from mid-gap. So the intrinsic Fermi level lies approximately in the gap halfway between the conduction band minimum and the valence band maximum. Increasing the electron carrier density raises the Fermi level. The, by doping the semiconductor with holes, you're going to lower the Fermi level below the intrinsic uh, gap. So you're able now to sit down and look at this formation diagram and get some physics out of it. The physics out of it is very simple, that if you are at the situation where you dope the material heavily with uh, electrons, there are lots of electrons in the conduction band, the Fermi level is going to be high. These electrons now have the ability to uh, populate neutral defects and make them negatively charged. Positively charged defects are essentially going to be depleted from your system because you have these excess electrons in the valence band. So it's going to be easier to create a negatively charged state uh, for high levels when you're close to the conduction band. The, con the converse also applies if you're close to the bottom, of, if you're close to the valence band, what, you're meaning, what you mean is that you've taken the Fermi level and you've p dipe doped the material. So there are a lot of holes in the conduction band and valence band maximum. So it's going to be relatively easy to have a charged state go from a neutral situation to essentially steal an electron, a donate electron to the valence band maximum and become positive. And negative charge states would be highly energetic and the, pro the propensity for formation is going to be very low. So this model of how do you calculate a formation energy was generalized for many different types of atoms by Zhang and Northup back in 1991. And they showed that you can use this relationship to look at systems where you add atoms to the system or subtract them depending upon the values of n. And again, you need a chemical potential for your species as a reference state. So I'll go back to this diagram. Your thermodynamics is here and here. This is how much energy it takes to bring in or take out an atom. This is how much energy you need to add or subtract from the system from a chemical reservoir of electrons, namely the Fermi level. Your, your calculations, what you can basically use theory to calculate, are these guys. The total energy of the system with a defect and the total energy of the system without a defect. And there's a problem with that. You can't calculate from first principles a system that has 10 to the 23rd particles. You don't do that for a bulk ordinary crystal. What you do is simply take, uh, you recognize that a crystal is periodic. You create some small primitive cell and you repeat it. You Fourier transform the Schrodinger wave equation so you just solve it in this small regime and you're good to go. For defect, you've got additional pro an additional problem. So here's a cartoon adapted by Schultz and all and Edwards. <laughs> 
here's a piece of bulk, and you come in with either an ion or radiation, and you cause a defect to form. So if you want to calculate from first principles using density functional theory the energy of that defect, you, what you would do is use the same procedure and same prescription and essentially put these in a periodic array of supercells and then Fourier transform the Schrodinger wave equation just to solve what's going on inside one individual supercell. The problem is that these defects are charged. There, there's going to be a reaction or interaction with all of these positively charged supercells, and that's going to lead to an error in your calculation that's going to be unphysical or spur spurious. So there are lots of ways to get around it. These are the details of the calculation. If you want to calculate the formation energy for a charge defect, this is not enough. You need to have some type of correction to the fact that neighboring supercells have charges and they're going to give you an error to your calculation. So a lot of people are working very, very hard to come up with correct tools to correct this uh, deficiency. Recently, Tim Kassiris and his group were able to come up with a scheme that turned out to be very useful for defects in two-dimensional materials as well as defects in three-dimensional materials. So let's see what results we get. If we use density functional theory, and the recipe we've spelled out before, which uses quantum mechanics and thermodynamics, we can calculate the formation energy for, let's say, our NV uh, color center in diamond. Well, here we're using the experimental band gap on the x-axis. And by plotting the formation energy, both quantum mechanically and using thermodynamics, we get a set of curves and the bold curves are really the key thing to pay attention to. This, these are where the charge state is at to be favored for a given value of the Fermi level. Turns out that if you take intrinsic diamond, where the number of hole carriers and electron carriers are roughly equivalent, the, band, uh, the Fermi level is approximately mid-gap. So you're looking at regimes on this graph close to about a half. The favorite state, theoretically, for the NV charge state is minus one, and that agrees with what's been observed experimentally. How about other color centers? Let's say the uh, germanium defect in diamond. Same story. We were able to calculate these results and compare them with the work of Ishikawa and his colleagues in Japan and show that the preferred charge state for the germanium defect in diamond is also uh, a minus one charge state. So given the, uh, the ability now to actually go into the lab and make color centers and hopefully devices of them, of other elements in the group for a uh, column of the periodic table, namely tin and lead, we've calculated the, using density functional theory, the formation energy for all of these particular color centers. We put in the color center uh, for the carbon uh, vacancy for a reason I'll explain in a minute. And again, the prediction is that for intrinsic diamond, the negative charge state would be preferred for all of these particular color centers. Now, that's not a constant. You can vary uh, the charge state you want by just varying the Fermi level of the system by doping it. So uh, here's a plot of another way to look at that. Uh, for NV, silicon vacancy, germanium vacancy, tin vacancy, and lead, there's an energy that you need to have the charge state go from negative to negative one to zero, or from zero to minus one. That's the formation energy. And you can actually plot these guys. And again, roughly around mid-gap for an intrinsic semiconductor, the minus one charge state is preferred. So we have a way of combining quantum mechanics and thermodynamics to calculate from first principles how much energy it takes to form a defect, be it amphoteric, neutral, or charged in a semiconductor. Problem is that that's not the only problem going, um, going on in the system. When you generate experimentally an NV center, there are a lot of things happening. And you just don't have an NV center isolated in space. So uh, this is an experimental plot from colleagues in our center, Mike Walsh and Derek Eglin, MIT, and Susan Van Dam at Delft. 
where they're looking at the profile of what happens when you actually create an NV color center in diamond. So let's focus on this side of the graph. So these green dots in diamond are natural uh, nitrogen vacancies, where uh, N14 naturally occurring nitrogen vacancies. And the goal is if you want to create an NV center in diamond, you use ion implantation and bombard this system with positively charged nitrogen-15 ions. Um, why are you using different types of nitrogen? Well, some of them have different nuclear spins than others, and that's going to affect the optical electron properties of the NV center that you're going to make. What you have here on the right is a profile of the density, uh, how deep inside the solid these species are. So let's go ahead and dope this system. Once you implant through ion implantation uh, N15s into diamond, so here's an example of implanted N15, here's an example of implanted N, uh, N14, that's not the whole story. Ion implantation causes carbon vacancies to occur, and there are lots of them. That's indicated by these purple lines. And there's no way to get around that. It's not avoidable. Um, the task was to make an NV center, and you can have a combination of these vacancies with the nitrogen-14 and nitrogen-15 to produce these NV centers. That's a good thing. But the problem is you also have these carbon vacancies floating around. You can't get around those. So we would like to look, look at ways to model the formation of a complex of uh, carbon vacancies with co color centers and diamond. They are around there. They exist. There's no way that you can avoid them. And we want to ask, what, what problems are they going to cause for us optically? So here's a model of a carbon vacancy by uh, using DFT. This is a piece of the diamond crystal lattice where we just pulled out a carbon atom. Uh, the geometry is shown here. And here's a picture of the ISO surface of the charge density. And it's interesting to see that these are sp3-like orbitals pointing towards the center of where the vacancy, the carbon vacancy was. So what we're worrying, what we're worrying about is the ability of uh, let's say, a germanium vacancy to form a complex with carbon vacancies. So here's one example of a, such a creature where there are just three carbon vacancies. Again, here's sort of a ball and stick model optimized using DFT. And here's the result showing where the charge distributions look like. Um, there's an important thing to realize about this carbon vacancy. In fact, if you have three of them strung together, that forms a structure which is typically paramagnetic. And that's going to have a lot of disastrous effects on the coherence of light emitted or absorbed by our neighboring color center. So these carbon vacancies, you just can't get around them. They're there by the nature of how you uh, form the color center by ion implementation. But what you have to do is try to ask yourself, can, is there a way of figuring out how damaging are they to the properties of the color center at hand? So the question shifts from one of thermodynamics to kinetics. So here's a picture of a piece of a bulk of a crystal where you have a vacancy. And you can imagine this system having a certain energy. So if this atom diffuses or migrates to this site, what you're effectively doing is having a vacancy moving from here to here. It takes energy to do that. When atoms move, or vacancies move in a crystal, what's happening is that bonds are being destroyed, and then they're being, and then they're being reestablished. That energy is characterized by the height of this curve, and it's sort of an energy of activation barrier. So in DFT, in density functional theory, you can actually calculate how much energy it takes for a system to go from some initial state to a final state, how much energy do you need to get over this diffusion barrier? So there's a particular method that we've used. Uh, it's called the nudged elastic barrier method. And it allows you to calculate the lowest energy pathway that you can go from one initial state to one final state. 
there are many pathways you can imagine that the vacancy that can diffuse in a system. But once you identify the lowest pathway, then for that particular pathway, you can calculate the barrier height for that system. This method was used, proposed originally by Henkelman and Johnson, and it was used by Coate uh, Defoe, Evelyn Hu, and Tim Coxiris in looking at the diffusion of vacancies of silicon in the 4-H uh, polytype of silicon carbide. So here is a prediction or an answer from what, what uh, theory can tell us. Suppose you have a carbon vacancy inside bulk diamond. And you want to know how is its diffusion affected if you have some remote stationary color center, like, for example, the germanium vacancy. Well, it turns out that there's going to be a barrier height that the uh, vacancy has to go and pass through. But that, vacancy, that barrier height is going to be dependent upon the charge state of that carbon vacancy. And we have predicted that, in fact, if that charge state is negatively charged, it's going to be easier for that carbon vacancy to diffuse throughout the crystal in the presence of that color center than if it were positively charged. There's an easy way to understand that. The easy way to understand that is that you have that carbon vacancy. It's surrounded by unsaturated sp3 orbitals. Once you charge this thing up so it's negatively charged, that negative charge can saturate those local dandelion bonds. That essentially lowers the barrier height, it frees up those bonds, and the vacancy is allowed to go on its merry way. So we have systematically, for the um, group four color centers, posed the following question and tried to address a reasonable answer and explanation for it. How does the charge state of a carbon vacancy affect its diffusion within diamond. So here I'm just looking at an isolated carbon vacancy in bulk diamond. And we've calculated the barrier height for diffusion using the aforementioned method as a function of the charge on that vacancy. Well, our result is this interesting in, uh, V-shaped curve. And it turns out it's very easy to physically interpret what's going on here. You start from right to left, as you increase the Fermi level of the system, in other words, you make it, you dope it uh, so there are more electrons in the conduction band, the charge associated with this carbon vacancy gets bigger and bigger and bigger. What that means is that that charge can be used to saturate the dangling bonds surrounding the vacancy. That, in effect, lowers the barrier height, and it makes it easier for the vacancy to move or diffuse throughout the crystal. Hence, this barrier height gets smaller and smaller as the charge on the vacancy increases. Now, this goes on up to a point. Uh, you're passivating these dangling bonds, but there are a finite number of dangling bonds you have to passivate. And eventually, you reach a stage where Coulomb repulsion sets in. That it's going to be harder for this negatively charged vacancy to migrate through the crystal. And you can see that with an increase in the barrier height of the system. So the question is, that's great for an isolated carbon vacancy. What if that carbon vacancy is in the presence of some fixed color center, like an NV center? Well, there are two protocol, prototypical examples I want to look at. One's great, and one's not so great. If, in fact, you can calculate, we have done this, what the barrier height for, an isolate, for a carbon vacancy looks like in the presence of a color center, and if, in fact, its dependence looks like this, I argue that that's a great thing. It's a green light. That means that the barrier height for diffusion of this color center, of the vac carbon vacancy in the presence of the color center is high. That is, if you are a carbon vacancy, there is no great incentive for you to approach a stationary color center and form a complex with it. If, in fact, the reverse turns out to be true, if the calculated result of the barrier height of a carbon vacancy in the presence of a color center has this feature, then you're in trouble. Because that means that 
the barrier height for diffusion is much less than it is for the isolated carbon vacancy, and there's a greater chance that these carbon vacancy color center complexes will form. And that's bad because you want to basically put in your sample isolated color centers, know exactly where they are, and not have their uh, abilities degraded by coupling with other impurities in the sample. So we've looked at this phenomenon in a range of color centers. We get this same sort of inverted V-like structure for the same physical reason, that for uh, as you dope the material, this is the whole semiconductor, and put more electrons in the conduction band, you charge up the vacancy. That charged vacancy then can saturate dangling bonds, and it's easier for the vacancy to diffuse throughout the crystal up to a point, and then you start putting more and more charge on that vacancy, and you essentially have coulombic forces coming into play, slowing down the process. Same thing is true for the uh, isolated, for the um, carbon vacancy in the presence of an NV center. It's also true for the germanium color center. And we've discovered that there's some universality in this, namely that if you look at how the barrier heights depend upon not just silicon and germanium vacancy, but lead and tin, you still get this V-like structure. But the key thing is that experimentally, all of the color centers that you see that exist all lie in this particular regime where the charge on the vacancy center is of about negative 1.5. That's good, but it's bad. It's bad because especially for lead and tin, you have relatively low barrier heights. So you have a greater chance of forming these complexes between carbon vacancies and color centers made of lead and tin. What you would like to do is change your system so that you're looking at uh, group four color centers like lead and tin with higher barrier heights for formation. And you can do that by just changing the charge on the color center or changing the Fermi level on the sem on the, of the semiconductor or doping it. So doping it is a way to alter or tailor the Fermi level and actually change the chance that you would lose a lot of NV color centers by recombination with um, carbon vacancies to a situation here in this lime green regime where the barrier heights are large enough to prohibit that. So uh, we're making a prediction here, and the prediction is that while lead and tin color centers have been seen experimentally, they've been fabricated, You've got to worry about ways to keep them uh, from losing their integrity by combination with carbon vacancies that are formed on ion implantation processes. And a way to do that is just to simply tailor the charge on the color vacancy, either by doping or applying some electric field bias. So I want to sum up and basically give us some time for some questions. Um, there's been a lot of excitement in coming up with new ways to both study and fabricate color centers beyond NV or silicon. The group four elements in the periodic table don't have uh, the problem of a dipole moment, so they have inversion symmetry. That's going to help us somewhat in getting signals where the homogeneity is not a problem. There's been a lot of work in the literature on looking at germanium vacancies very recently, tin vacancies, and this year, lead. Uh, I'm not aware of um, what people have done in terms of applying strain to these systems. So one thing I want to mention that uh, Marco's group is very keenly interested in is that you can change the optoelectronic properties of these color centers by putting them in a cantilever and straining them. And that changes the uh, electronic structure of the energy levels in the gap and improves their uh, photo uh, fluorescence properties. There's a possibility you may be able to do that for lead uh, as well as tin. You can combine a classical knowledge of chemical reaction thermodynamics with first principles DFT to fact calculate how formation energies are formed from these new color centers and 
DFT has given us a way or prediction of mitigating against the, pre, the formation of complexes of vacancy, color, vacancy uh, carbon vacancies that are formed by ion implantation with color centers in the material by essentially just altering the Fermi level in the material, either by doping or applying some external bias. So I want to thank my collaborators in this work, Roderick Quate Defo, sitting in the back, who actually did all the calculations that we've discussed today, and Tim Kixiris. And thank you for your attention. Yes.